Well, this morning, um, first of all, I thought, well, Christmas uh, is coming quickly, and oftentimes I'll sort of uh, move away from whatever series we're on, uh, if it's Easter or Christmas time. And then I started thinking, you know, uh, instead of completely moving away, why don't we try and integrate a little bit of uh, what uh, Christmas might, uh, some Christmas themes along with uh, our Route 66 series. And, and I'm going to attempt to do that this morning because uh, one of the things probably that we aren't completely aware of is as we've gone on the journey, not only down Route 66, the road, but uh, through the books of the Bible that we've gone through, is that there are a lot of little things, uh, I'm going to call them signs this morning, almost like road signs, that have pointed toward what we're getting ready to celebrate, which is the, the coming of Christ and uh, Christmas. And so as we move down the road, uh, one of the things that I thought about is the next logical stop on the highway is a little town called uh, Devil's Elbow. And I thought, well, that doesn't really seem like a great place to stop for Christmas. Devil's Elbow, and it's been a very famous Route 66 uh, stop because uh, the big Piney River makes a big bend there and there's a, kind of this cool old metal uh, bridge that, that is part of it. And so a lot of guys, if they're you know, doing the Route 66 thing, will stop there. And, and uh, of course, even if we don't stop there, we should stop in at the Elbow Inn, which is sort of another famous Route 66 stop. But I thought, you know, Devil's Elbow just doesn't seem like appropriate. And so, you know, I looked and five miles down the road is a town called St. Robert. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. It's the perfect stop on Route 66. So this morning we're stopping in St. Robert, and we'll, you know, we'll drop into the Route 66 diner there, and, uh, which is actually something that's relatively new, as you can see, but uh, kind of fun on the inside, uh, you know, the whole diner thing. And then we could even uh, spend the night at the DeVille Motor Inn, which is one of the oldest uh, motel still along Route 66, although I, I got to confess, I'm not sure it's still open, but we'll hang out in, in St. Robert for a little bit. Perfect place to celebrate Christmas. And, and then again, instead of uh, looking at a specific book of the Bible, uh, I want to show you how woven throughout are road signs that point to Christmas. By the way, I was thinking this will, this will show a lot of our age, but how many of you remember going down the highway the Burma Shave signs. How many? Okay, we're really showing our age, aren't we? Okay, and uh, but I can remember as a kid, you know, kind of on the highway. It was, you, boy, you just really looked forward to when is the next Burma Shave series of signs. For those of you that don't know, it was a whole little string of signs. You can kind of look up on the top, and you get a little bit of picture uh, of what it was. So, like the first sign would say, "If we could put," and then you'd have to wait a while. These signs up there. And then you go down the road a little bit, twould be more fun to go by air. And then, uh, and then as, as soon as you came to the end of it, every time there was the Burma Shave sign. And uh, by the way, Route 66 had more of these than any highway in America. So it was sort of characterized by this. But, uh, but what I thought was, gee, you know, as we've gone through, uh, as far as we've gone so far on our little journey, there are a lot of road signs, kind of messages all the way along the way. And so what I want to do is go back uh, kind of through some of what we've already looked at, but highlight a few of these road signs that really point toward, uh, toward uh, Christmas. And we'll begin by going back to leg one. And, uh, and by the way, these are the three questions that I think the road signs answer for us this morning. And that's simply, who was this person going to be that had been prophesied? Where was he going to be born? And when was that going to happen? And as we go through these signs, you'll see how these questions are answered. The first uh, sign, uh, and by the way, the takeaway on all of this is simply Christmas is coming, all right? So the first road sign goes all the way back to uh, leg one uh, going through Illinois, and it was in the third chapter of Genesis. And this is considered by many to be the very first prophecy of the coming of Messiah. And when you go back to that text, it simply reads this, and I will put enmity in speaking to the serpent um, after the fall, between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, answering the question who, this is a very broad road sign that we're given. And basically what it tells us is that uh, when this Savior comes, he will be a human being and he will be a male. 
So we've just eliminated half of the human race in terms of answering the question who. We know it is a human born of a woman and it will be a male. We go down the road a little bit further and the next road sign about who here in leg one is one that you were all familiar with because we've gone back to this on a number of occasions. But this is that text when God enters into this covenant uh, with Abraham. And he says to Abraham, I'll bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So now we know that the who is going to be a descendant of Abraham. And pretty much, think about it, that eliminates all the rest of the families on earth. We know that when the Savior comes, he is going to be descendant of Abraham, and that means he's going to be one of two lines. He's either going to be a descendant of Abraham's son Isaac, or he's going to be a descendant of Abraham's son Ishmael. We get down line a little bit further, and our next road sign tells us in Genesis chapter 21, 12, we read this. But God said to him, don't be so distressed about the boy, and he's talking about Ishmael here when, uh, when Isaac is getting ready to, uh, uh, excuse me, when Abraham is getting ready to send Ishmael away. Uh, Don't be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. So now we know that it's not only through Abraham, but it's going to come through the descendants of Isaac, which now means it's going to be one of two ethnic groups that, uh, that the Messiah is going to come from. He's either going to be a Jew or he's going to be an Edomite. And we get down a little further down the road, and our next road sign tells us in Genesis chapter uh, 25, 23, we read this. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. So now what we know is, is that it is going to be a Jew that will be the Messiah. He will be uh, Jacob's descendant. And that means that he is going to be one, come from one of 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And when we get to the end of the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, the blessing are being given, Jacob's given the blessing to all of his children, which will eventually become the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. And in this blessing, uh, the Holy Spirit moves him to make this statement. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. And so now we know out of all of the 12 tribes that when the Messiah comes, he is going to come and he will be a descendant that will come through Judah's descendants and will be part of the the, uh, tribe of Judah. And then one more who road sign, which we just hit uh, over in leg two. And uh, as we went through leg two just a couple of weeks ago, remember that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, a promise is given to David. And in that promise, we read this, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So through all of these road signs, we really get a sense of of how to identify who the the Messiah will be. He'll be a human, he'll be a male, he will be part of Abraham's descendants from the line of Isaac, Uh, he will come through Jacob, so he's going to be a Jew from the tribe of Judah, and he will be able to trace his descent back to the house of David. So we're given a pretty good kind of picture here, the road signs kind of pointing forward to what is going to happen uh, as these things get fulfilled. And, uh, and of course, the, again, the takeaway out of the who part of the road signs is simply Christmas is coming. Now, second question that, that these road signs tell us is where? And we're pretty familiar with this, but the where question, we have to go over to leg four, of our journey. We haven't gotten there yet, but leg four of the journey, um, which will uh, take us through uh, Kansas, uh, in in Kansas, excuse me, we're going to skip Kansas, that's 
leg three. In Oklahoma, uh, we're going to be looking at the prophets, the Old Testament prophets of Israel. One of those prophets was named Micah. And in the book of Micah, uh, chapter five, verse two, we get another road sign, and we're told this, but you, Bethlehem, though you're small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old. So very specifically, the, the Old Testament prophet says that, again, when Messiah comes, he is going to come out of Bethlehem. Now, this is real obvious to most of us because, of course, when we get into the New Testament, remember that when the Magi come, and uh, they come to King Herod, and by the way, most of, uh, oh, excuse me, we'll go back here. Did I? Okay. Um, most of the images we have of Christmas, they're not very accurate because we always see the wise men there when the baby's being born with the shepherds. And, and even the pictures that we had up this morning uh, had the wise men and the shepherds all there. And the text doesn't say that. The text actually says that it's after maybe as long as two years after, by the way. I hope this doesn't ruin your whole Christmas. I mean, you know, <laughs> Dave, you could probably salvage this on Christmas Eve for us. So anyway, um, but remember, they come, and they come to King Herod. And we read this. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Well, Herod gets quite distressed about this. And we've talked a little bit about what a head case Herod was. Insanely jealous. And so suddenly someone's coming along and say, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? And of course, Herod's thinking, time out. I'm the king of the Jews. Okay. So what does he do? He calls in uh, his chief priests and his scribes. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And of course, what happens is, is that the priests and scribes quote Micah 5.2. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it's written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the tribes or rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And so the where was clear even at the time of Herod. Now, also, you know, the story is so fascinating because we know that, uh, that when the Christ comes, he has to come through this lineage that the road signs have all pointed to. Ultimately, he has to come through the family line of David, and he has to be born in Bethlehem. Well, Mary and Joseph, of course, live in Nazareth, in Galilee, about 60 miles north of Bethlehem. But both of them, we're told quite clearly in Scripture, they come both uh, biologically and legally, they come from the line of David. And so here they are in Nazareth, and, and in what I think is just this amazing sort of little uh, sense of the divine engineering and orchestration of, of human history in some ways, so suddenly Caesar Augustus, the ruler of the Roman Empire, decides, I think I'm going to take a census right now. Well, Mary, of course, is pregnant and uh, she is carrying Jesus Christ. And suddenly, the Roman emperor says, I'm going to have a census. And in the census, everybody had to go back to the place of their family of origin. And because both Joseph and Mary come from the lineage of David, they've got to go back to David's family hometown to register for the census. And where is it they have to go? Bethlehem exactly as the road sign pointed to. And so not only are we given this picture of who is the Christ going to be, but we're told very specifically where the Christ is going to be born. And of course, uh, it is Bethlehem. And the takeaway again, Christmas is coming. All right, one final question that the road signs point to, of course, is the question of, well, when? We know something of who, we know a little bit, I mean, we know specifically where, but how about 
when. And one of the most fascinating prophecies or road signs, as we're calling them this morning, answers this question, and it's found over in the book of Daniel. So we're still going to be in leg four, and we'll be coming to this, of course, in, uh, in a few uh, months now, weeks, months, as we get there. But in Daniel chapter nine, we have a fascinating uh, prophecy that's given, and some of you have been with me when I've worked through this before, but let me remind you about it. Daniel is praying, and the reason he's praying at this point in time is that we're told in the text that he's, he, he's been reading Jeremiah the prophet. And of course, Daniel has been taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And, uh, and he's one of the kind of the cream of the crop that the Babylonians take back to Babylon to sort of indoctrinate and to train and to uh, impart a Babylonian culture because part of what they did then with uh, nations that they had conquered is that this was their strategy for then making those nations uh, become faithful and uh, to the empire because then they would eventually take these kind of cream of the crop people that had been trained and send them back to rule over the conquered land. Well, Daniel is one of these guys that ends up in Babylon. But as he's reading the prophet Jeremiah, he realizes that the, this captivity, Jeremiah said, was only supposed to last 70 years. And the, the sense you get from the text, by the way, and, and at the beginning of Daniel chapter 9, it talks about specifically uh, how that this is happening at the time, uh, a certain time in Darius's rule. And we think because the captivity, the very first part of the captivity started in 607 BC, and if you subtract, you know, um, uh, 70, excuse me, yeah, kind of add or subtract, however you look at it, 70 years, uh, the captivity should have been over by around uh, 357 BC, somewhere in that range. And we know now that it's just about that period of time when Cyrus is then the emperor and Cyrus sends the first wave of Jews back to begin to rebuild the temple. But Daniel doesn't know that yet. And so he's praying. He's praying about this, and, and you get a sense that, boy, the 70 years have got to be, you know, pretty close to being up. And as he's praying, uh, God sends the angel Gabriel to him, and Gabriel uh, gives him answers to his question uh, of when, and, and it's contained in this text. Daniel says, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord for my the Lord my God for his holy hill while I was still in prayer Gabriel the man I had seen in the earlier vision came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice and he instructed me and said to me Daniel I have now come to give you insight and understanding as soon as you began to pray a word went out which I have come to tell you for you're highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place." Now, the text is going to go on and it's going to make some other statements that kind of tie into this, but, but let me kind of briefly kind of look at how this figures into the, the question of when. Uh, the text talks about 77s, the Hebrew word there is Shavua. Many of your translations will say uh, 70 weeks, and the, the idea here is that it's not a week of days, it's a week of years. So that 77s talk about 70 periods of 70 years. Now, the, the uh, prophecy is about Daniel's people, of course, who are the Jews, and Daniel's holy city, the city of Jerusalem. A little bit later on in the text, the trigger to when these 77s begin has to do with the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem, which again hasn't happened yet, and that following that decree to rebuild and restore that Messiah would come, 
Messiah would be cut off or killed. The city and the sanctuary would be destroyed. Uh, and in the midst of this, a covenant was going to be made, and ultimately the end of the age would come. Now, there's a timetable that's given in here, all the way really from Daniel's time, clear to the second coming of Christ in the end of the age. But in terms of trying to date when the Messiah would come, when the Christ would come, when you begin taking this apart, it's a pretty fascinating timetable. Uh, Many of you probably uh, are familiar with something of the story of Jack the Ripper. Uh, it was a, a true event that took place, of course, in London, right around the turn of the 20th century, end of the 19th turn of the 20th century. What many of you might not be familiar with is who was the chief of criminal investigation at Scotland Yard during the time of Jack the Ripper that led that entire process of finding him, tracking him down, arresting him, and that man's name was Sir Robert Anderson. And Robert Anderson uh, was a believer, and he was fascinated with this particular prophecy and timetable, and he ended up writing a book that had tremendous impact at the time it was written. Again, this is like 1901. This is, again, the turn of the 20th century. The book was called The Coming Prince, and what Sir Robert Anderson did is he took this prophecy and began to break it down. And here's how he broke it down. He knew that the trigger was a decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. That happens and it's contained and we're going to hit it when we go through one of our historic books. And that trigger came on March 14th, 445 B.C. It was the 20th year of Artaxerxes, and this was the second, uh, this was the second group of captives that came back, and this particular decree was given. Now, the temple had already been rebuilt, but there was no city yet because the walls hadn't been built. And so uh, what, what happens here in 445 B.C. is, is that the cupbearer, Nehemiah, uh, you know, is sent back to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So uh, Robert Anderson used this as the trigger date of the prophecy. And then he began to look at exactly how that timetable broke down. Uh, the timetable talked about 70, uh, 70 weeks, and it actually broke it into two separate parts, actually three separate parts, but it, it talked about uh, one uh, part of that, which would be seven sevens, and then there would be uh, 62 sevens. And so you've got, you know, you kind of begin to process this. And so what that comes out is 483 years from the time that this decree was issued on March 14th, 445 BC. And if you calculate this out and you use a, what is called a prophetic year of 360 days, the Jewish calendar is real wild, by the way. There are seven different figures in terms of how long a Jewish year lasts, depending upon all kinds of tricky stuff that I won't go into this morning, but sort of the mean of that and what was used to calculate prophetic years was 360 days. And so if you simply multiply the 483 years of the 69 sevens, time that amount, you, you come out with 173,880 days. This is what Robert Anderson came up with. And calculating that from 445 BC, if you then, in March 14th, added these 173,883 days, you would come up with the date of roughly uh, in our month of April in 30 AD, which we now know was the specific Palm Sunday that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, fulfilling the, another prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. And then the prophecy said he would be cut off, which of course happens uh, at Easter. Uh, the city would be destroyed, which took place in 70 AD when the prince of the people who is to come uh, came and the Roman Empire under the Roman uh, general Titus destroyed the city, destroyed the sanctuary, and that there would be one period of seven left, which we won't go into this morning, but it has to do with uh, what happens in the seven last years of human history. But if you take this date and then you go back and subtract 33 years, which was the life 
roughly, we think, of, of how old Jesus was at the time that this would have been fulfilled. Uh, you have 11,880 uh, days, and you subtract that, you come up with 168,000 days, which takes us back roughly to 3 to 4 B.C. And so the when of when the Christ was to be born, according to this prophecy, uh, would have been somewhere in this range of 3 to 4 B.C., which, by the way, we believe is when Jesus was actually born, not in the zero year, and we know that simply because although there's some debate about this also, but we know Jesus was born before Herod died, and historians believe that Herod died somewhere around 3 to 4 B.C. And so we know that, you know that when the calculation that we go by now was made of the zero date, probably not accurate, although that's being debated again these days also. So anyway, all right. So, but, but think about this. Why did the wise men connect this unique cosmic phenomena with the birth of the king of the Jews. How was it that these guys knew when, when the Jews didn't even have it quite figured out? And the answer, I think, it's a little speculative, but I think there's good reason to believe it, is simply this. They come from the east. They come from the region of Persia, the region of ancient Babylon. And this is where Daniel was when he received this prophecy. He was in Babylon. And if you go back to the book of Daniel, what was Daniel's job in Babylon? He achieved such... Uh, um, he, he, you know, he kind of rose to this great status before the emperor of the Babylonians and the, the emperor, because of Daniel and his ability you know, to interpret dreams and not only interpret dreams, but be able to tell him what the dream was you know, it, before he interpreted it. And he was put in charge of the Magi. Now, it's incomprehensible to think that Daniel, in charge of the Magi, did not teach them the prophetic promises of the coming of the Messiah. And so here you have pagan wise men from the region of ancient Babylon, and they know the road sign better than the religious leaders of Israel. And I think it's based on this prophecy uh, out of Daniel chapter 9. Well, the takeaway, obviously, Christmas is coming, all right? Now, uh, we put this together. Who, who is the Christ going to be? Well, he's going to be a descendant of David, for sure. Where is he going to be born? Whoops, I'm going to go back here, excuse me. Where will he be born? He'll be born in Bethlehem. And when will he be born? Somewhere around 3 to 4 B.C. Now, when you put that all together, together, let me skip ahead to leg five to kind of close things up this morning and see how all those road signs came together. And we go to one of the classic texts in the Gospels, that's you know, what leg five will be, and there in Luke chapter two, it's kind of one of the two classic Christmas texts. And we're told this, and look how all of this fits exactly with all of these road signs. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came, which was the exact time prophesied by Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them at the inn. And the takeaway was simple, Christmas is here. So how about we all come and celebrate it together next Saturday night? Huh? Right, let's pray. Lord, uh, it, I think it's just really cool. Uh, I think so often we kind of think about Jesus and we know the claims about him. But Lord, uh, it, those claims were not with uh, massive amounts of evidence. Lord, I, I know someone told me once there were over 300 
prophecies in the Old Testament fulfilled by Christ when He came, but, but certainly uh, when we simply look at these road signs along the way and how you, you're very careful to, uh, to show your people who was this going to be. He, he was going to be Abraham's descendant, Isaac's descendant, Jacob's descendant, Judah's descendant, David's descendant, and, and Lord, that you narrowed it down so much. And then, then when the time came, of course, Joseph and Mary, they, they fit that. The descendants of David and Jesus as he's born can trace his lineage back uh, this way. And, and where, so specifically, Lord, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus is born, for Micah to be able to, you know, to say, when the Christ comes, he will be born in Bethlehem, so much so that, that the, even the chief priests and the scribes of Herod knew when that would happen, where that would happen, and then the when, Lord, to, to think about how specific uh, Gabriel was in, in giving Daniel this, this message of, of the coming of Messiah and, uh, Lord, all of the events that would surround that. And, and really, when we look at this, there's nobody else in history that, that really could have fulfilled all of this at this point in time. And, and so when, we, when we, we look at Jesus and as we celebrate Christmas together, we're so grateful, Lord, that you've given us the road signs. And we simply pray, Lord, that we would appreciate that and maybe in fresh ways this year as we celebrate, Lord Jesus, uh, your incarnation uh, there in Bethlehem. And we pray this in your name, Christ. Amen.